So you all remember, I think you are my age, and some of you probably are still younger, but you remember about scientific socialism that was introduced by uh, the Ka'anka, the, the, the revolution. Uh, that imposed some sort of uh, poor policies to agriculture. And these poor policies can really lead into a disaster sometimes. And looking at the literature and the history back, you can see that during that time we had some sort of controlled market price development of ADC, Agriculture Development Corporation, where all the food grain that was produced by the farmers were forcibly sold to these uh, uh, entities. And then you have ENC, Inch, where they, have, they used to store all these products. Uh, and then you had decreased grain production in terms of like farmers were not having the incentive to produce grain because they were forced to sell in this market and uh, the market was basically for ADC. Uh, and then you had increased food import as a result of that bad policy and then we had food aid in return. So food aid is not a phenomenon that started recently after the civil war. So this is something that is started way back in the early uh, 70s because we were not able to cover the requirement of the country. And then you see in uh, late 1980s, there was a change in the policy from the government because of the <coughs> pressure from the IMF and all the things. And then you will realize that at some point, there was a market liberalization where the farmers were allowed to sell their products wherever they want. And then that resulted in increase in grain production, and then there was some food self-sufficiency in that year and, and the following years, because there was surplus at that time. Uh, and then the civil war started, and as a result of this, you will see that emergency uh, at this time, where from 1990 to 2010, so you have, we have an emergency situation where NGOs are dominating. <coughs> uh, decrease in food production, again, food aid came back again into the, into the country. So this tells you that Somalia can become food self-sufficient if there are proper <coughs> policies, if there are proper uh, work done in the country. Now, I'll explain to you how how did it happen that in 1986, when we're talking about uh, food self-sufficiency, we know that maize and sorghum are the major two crops, grain crops, in the country. So I'm taking just an example of maize here, where there was self-sufficiency, and how did it happen? There are two ways that this can happen, even now, even today. One way is in, in just increasing the land, uh, the land produce of, of grain, like for example, in 1986, you will see that increase in, in cultivated land from 109,000 hectare into 350,000 hectare in 1985. So this shows you that we have enough land to cultivate. We don't need food aid. We don't need food imports. There is enough land to cultivate. You can see the graphs here, 1980. There was almost like uh, 100,000 <coughs> hectare uh, of maize production. By the time the liberalization happens, so the, there was a liberalization in price, so then, then you see that uh, a, a quick jump in the production. That means we can mobilize more land to produce crop. Now, there is a second option as well that I would like to uh, engage you in this as well. The second option is increased production per unit area. So that means if you, if you don't have even enough land, you can increase production per unit area. That means if you have one hectare and you're producing only 10 quintals, you can double that or triple that by introducing new technologies. And if you can see here, I just want to, to prove to you here that uh, unfortunately Somalia from 1940 to today, <coughs> this is the production level that you see there. Uh, we're not above 10 quintals per hectare. For those of you who don't know quintals, it's like uh, in each quintal there's 100 kg. That means we cannot go beyond uh, 1,000 kilograms per hectare. Whereas in DC, the developed countries, in the 1940s, they were producing <laughs> about two quintals, uh, uh, 20, uh, yeah, two tons, two tons per hectare. But now, with time, the de developing countries were able to produce 
nine tons per hectare, even more in some countries. But we still, we still sit under this condition of 1940 until now, we're not able to produce more than uh, one ton per hectare, especially in terms of maize, and sorghum even less. So this, this, this is another option. This is the second option where we, we, we can increase production by in introducing new technologies such as good seed materials, fertilizers, pesticides, better crop management practices, and also better storage system. So with all this combined, we can double and triple the production per unit area. So there are two ways that we can do this uh, exercise. Now, I, I mentioned about the Green Revolution and how it brought peace and stability in Asia. And this is a, a practical example where farmers' adoption to appropriate technologies such as improved varieties, fertilizers, proper irrigation, proper crop, crop management practice can all lead to three, four fold production of grain. And in, in, in particular in Southeast Asia uh, and in many parts, including China, there was rice and wheat production that almost tripled. And this is to just to, re, to remind you that in India, 20 years, 25, 25 years back, there were importers of food. And nowadays, they're exporters of food. And the same with China and with all these countries. So I think there is an opportunity here that we can do the same thing even better. Now, the Green Revolution from 1960 and 1970, that was, it symbolized the process of using agriculture science to develop modern techniques for third world countries. Breakthrough in wheat and rice in Asia in mid 60s. It started in Mexico by a scientist who was a plant breeder by profession and he was given a Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize for peace because of bringing new hybrids and new varieties of wheat and rice which started in Mexico and spread throughout uh, south, uh, southwestern and eastern Asia. And cereal production increased significantly reduce poverty which could have become a breeding ground for civil unrest. I think our problem, if we overcome poverty and all these problems in Somalia, probably we can also bring peace through agriculture. And they brought peace and prosperity to many Asian countries. But unfortunately, during that time, Africa was left behind. But now, there is a new movement coming up in Africa. It's called African Green Revolution. And there was a conference that has taken place in 2008 in Oslo and raised some hope in the future of bring, to bring peace and prosperity through sustainable agriculture development. So there was some say during this time when Africa Green Revolution started, let us pull together and change Africa. Africa doesn't want charity. Success story started in Malawi. Probably some of you have heard about the story in Malawi. Uh, where at least Malawi, just five, ten years back, was a hunger country. But now it's a free hunger country, Malawi, because of this technology adoption. And Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, this is one of these uh, things that I have discussed. But unfortunately, again, Somalia was left behind from this Green Revolution in Africa. And the reason is because there's no peace. There is no stability. And this African Green Revolution is funded by <coughs> Gate and Malindi Foundation. It's going, spreading throughout Africa, and there's a production increase in many African countries. But who is there for Somalia? Who wants to go into Somalia and do some work? I think it's us. Not, we don't have to depend on other people now. I think it's us who have to do some work on this. Um, I just want to move into this to, uh, to give you a bit of flavor on such activities. What we as SATG, Somali Agriculture Technical Group, do in, this, uh, in Somalia. Uh, we do a lot of work which includes field trials. In fact, this is, uh, if you see here, uh, this is a mung bean variety uh, called Filson. If you see our book, we have SATG and Filson. Filson is a mung bean variety that was, uh, in fact, was a success story in late, 86, uh, in late 1986. And it was developed in the Bioregion uh, Research Center. So what happened is that 
soon after the war, the seed was lost and everything was lost. So SATG was able to bring back the seed from its uh, original source and increase the seed in North America as well as in Nairobi and send it back to Somalia. And now, uh, Filson is one of the success stories that we have uh, introduced back this variety into its original habitat. So, so uh, trying to throw it back. can you explain to us what kind of seed it is? What kind of grain is it? Oh, this is a monk bean, uh, or called bean gram. Is it beans or beans? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a green gram. It's a source of protein. Okay. So it's an early uh, maturing variety. From the time that you plant to time that you harvest, just takes 50 days. So we are trying to introduce Filson into whole Somalia, even though it was bred and developed in. And the, and the dryland agriculture in the bioregion, but we see that there's a lot of interest now that we went back to Somalia, doing some activities and research in uh, different varieties of maize and everything. Yes. So now we see that there's a lot of interest and we're sending the seed back and developing also a seed multiplication system right on the ground in, uh, in Somalia. Yes? Uh, well, do you use irrigation uh -huh. or is it a very poor? This is, uh, it can be used both in, under irrigation as well as under rainfall. So if you are planting in, a rain, uh, in uh, irrigation, you can harvest better uh, seed materials. And you can do the same thing in dry land as well, because it requires only, if you have one rainfall or two rainfalls, it's enough to produce the crop, because it's a short season. And in fact, it's ideal for the short rainy season, particularly in the dare season, where you have very short rainy season. So if you fail on major crops like maize and sorghum and other crops, you will not fail on this crop.